Hello and welcome to Rising Kashmir. Our today's guest needs no introduction. He is Professor and Head of Internal and Pulmonary Medicines, Sikkim's Dr. Parvez Kohl. Dr. Parvez, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, sir, let me start. Can you please elaborate between differences between COVID-19 and coronavirus types? See, uh, if you talk of uh, COVID-19, which is the disease form caused by SARS-2 virus, that is SARS-CoV-2, it's a new form of coronaviruses, and coronaviruses have been seen previously also, causing a mild flu-like illness, and that is gen generally self-limiting. However, there have been two major uh, outbreaks because of coronaviruses, which was uh, one in 2003, which was called the SARS, SARS. and then in 2012, uh, the MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, both of which consumed around 700 to 800 lives. This new virus is actually a new form of coronavirus, and it's called death and destruction worldwide. Sir, can you explain the community spread? What is, a, what is the community spread? Can you explain it? To us? You see, whenever we uh, talk of a patient of uh, coronavirus disease or any uh, inf inf uh, influenza-like illness or any other infectious disease, we generally look at the history of his having uh, traveled from an area which is positive for COVID disease, one, or he having had a contact with somebody who is a lab-confirmed case of COVID. So, Beyond these two, if you have none of these two uh, histories available and the person has got a COVID positivity, that's an indication that there is some degree of community spread in the community despite the fact that people who infect you don't have a clear history of a travel to a place where COVID has been reported from or a history of a contact with somebody who has a COVID positivity. And that is the level we say that it, community transmission has come. And this community transmission can be uh, very limited, where we can call it as a local Contain. community transmission. Or con and then it can be widespread, then uh, it's a widespread community transmission, uh, when everybody can get uh, without any knowledge of his, uh, where he has gotten from. Is there a community spread in Kashmir? Uh, if you take uh, my opinion, the answer is yes. If not a florid community transmission, there are evidences of local uh, community transmission definitely there because we have had patients who did not have a history of travel or did not remember a contact with somebody who was uh, lab confirmed positive with COVID. Which type of strain do we have in Kashmir? Uh, I don't think we have a genomic uh, uh, sequence of the strains of from Kashmir available. However, uh, in India, there is, I mean, if you look at the history of COVID in India, first patient uh, came from Kerala, and this was a medical uh, college student who came from China. So eventually, you can always uh, say that this is an imported COVID uh, in, in India as well. So the, the premise that somebody is saying that, uh, yeah, no, the COVID in India is probably a milder strain or it is less severe a strain. It seems to be far-fetched. There are three major types circulating the world over, which is the G uh, type, the V type or the S type. And this is concentrated in certain areas of the world. And we have which type of? We don't know. We don't know. There are only two genomes that have been submitted by the government of India. Mm -hmm. That is the National Institute of Virology has submitted to the... There is a, a global platform called GSAID. Okay. And that is where you submit all the sequences. There are only two genomes which have been uh, sequences which have been submitted to GSAID. And on the basis of two sequences, it is far-fetched to say... And we in have Kashmir, as of yet, we don't know any, anything. Which strain do we have in Kashmir? No, we don't. Because it, it basically needs a sequencing. It needs an isolation. Isolation means that you need to... This is process where you have to culture the virus. Okay. And after the virus is cultured, we need to determine its genetic sequence, that is the mm -hmm. genomic structure. And mm -hmm. after the sequencing is uh, done, then it is submitted into the GSA platform. And on the basis of the sequencing, you can actually differentiate whether uh, it belongs to A, B, C or uh, type of categories that is, have been determined. Is it possible to test everyone in the valley? Depends on your cushion, economic cushion. If you can afford it, why not? Question is that we, we, we are a poor state or a poor union territory of a poor country. But and is it necessary to test everyone? If you can upscale your testing as much as you can, it is great. You test, test and test. That is actually the idea to identify, to isolate, to contact trace and then take public health response measures. However, 
If you don't test, you just don't know the denominator. You don't know what is happening in the community. So it's worthwhile doing it, but I know it's cost intensive. It is difficult to uh, organize resources for getting it uh, done. Uh, so within the ambit of the frame that is possible for the administration, they take decisions and review those decisions periodically to find out how can they upscale the testing to a broader uh, community. Experts are also talking about the herd uh, testing or herd immunity. Can it be, is it possible uh, for Kashmir to... You see, herd immunity is that when a significant population of, the, uh, of a particular community gets infected, so they develop a, a response and the, an antibody response and that actually becomes protective for the, for, for the, for the community. The best is uh, the best herd immunity would be by after vaccination. Unfortunately, we don't have a vaccine available for COVID uh, disease as yet. So the next best is getting most of the population infected, so that in a low lethal form they develop infection, they uh, develop antibodies, and over a period of time they come to a level of antibody status where they stand protected. And that is uh, what is the model that was actually proposed to be followed by United Kingdom or by Sweden. However, they have backtracked, and uh, there has been there's there's a cost to this. I mean, th this concept because you expect that two percent of your population could die because of uh, the it's herd immunity. The, this and and if you are ex actually wanting that the whole population gets exposed and you are ready to take two percent of fat fatality, that means that anybody beyond a particular age group is at such a greater risk. Yes. A, B, somebody at a, with com comorbidity is such a, at a greater risk. Yes, I mean, if you are ready to take it, it's a, it's a huge public health decision. And if somebody can do it, fair enough. However, I would uh, want uh, the measures that is weight, uh, cluster contain, uh, probably open uh, your, uh, your, your, I mean, forget about containment for some time uh, in between, and then uh, let this go into the community in a, in, a, in a phased manner. And eventually the virus will determine your response rather than you determine Dr. the response. Doctor, very briefly, what are antibody tests? Can you please explain? Antibody it? tests are uh, tests that determine uh, as to whether you have got an antibody to the exposed virus, which means in case this SARS-CoV-2, suppose it gets into your body, the body develops antibodies. First, there is a, response, a kind of antibody called IgM, then followed by an IgG. So it is not a diagnostic test. If you have a positive test, it has got to be reconfirmed by a routine RT-PCR to find out whether you have a COVID infection or not. However, it would be a great test in order to find out if somebody has a good antibody response and he can go back to work. If you have a healthcare worker who has a very good antibody response, he can probably okay. safely work, work in a COVID area. Is it transmittable from the dead bodies? Uh, you see, you have to understand that dead bodies, once they are dead, they neither uh, cough, they neither sneeze or they don't respire. Uh -huh. So the chances of the, the layers of transmission from dead bodies mm. are minimal. However, there is a per, uh, an SOP which has got to be followed. You have to keep a double plastic bag in which you need to uh, keep the dead body before you actually uh, shout him in the Islamic fashion or whatever fashion, whatever religious uh, uh, faith you're following. That's one. Hugging and kissing of bodies is deprecated. You should not do it. And uh, there is a small risk, but, there but are whenever, chances. whenever you are actually, uh, whenever somebody, healthcare worker or a paramedic, is uh, taking care of the body, he's packing the body. That is the time that he has to be donned off very nicely. He has to, he has to have a personal protection equipment in a uh, nice fashion, in a real nice fashion, so that he doesn't get infection. It is very much like uh, dealing with but, any but, other. But person. there are chances of certainly yes, you can have because because you can touch a, a, a nasal secretion and then get your hand into contact uh, in, in, into contact with your uh, mouth or uh, nose and uh, cause uh, cause infection. Doctor, how many days or weeks it takes for the recovery of a patient? It is uh, variable. I mean, it is a highly individualistic uh, response. Uh, though we quarantine them for a particular specified period, so it varies from one. It varies from, from person to person. person. Somebody one. who has a high degree of immunity, uh -huh. uh, he is uh, able to ward off and fight the infection much easier than somebody who doesn't have a uh, great level of immunity or who has a comorbidity. So obviously, it varies from, from individual to patient individual. Patient to patient. Doctor, my last question: We cannot go on with this lockdown for long. What as a medical profession you would advise to the government to put us 
to stop this such type of a lockdown? It is, it is such a uh, difficult question to answer. And I tell you, uh, the, the government policy planners are in an unenviable position because uh, they have to look at the whole thing. They don't have to take their medical opinion only into consideration. It's not the public health response only. There are socioeconomic factors that come into play while they take their decision. And that is possibly the reason that they want to de-escalate these lockdowns in a grad graded and staggered fashion. However, if you take only the medical standpoint, I would want the lockdown to continue till the vaccine is available. But obviously, I can, uh, That's not I, can, possible. I, I, can I can say that it's not possible. possible. So it's very difficult for me to say when, give you a timeline. It's the virus that dynamics that is going to tell us as to what our graded or staggered public health response would be. As of now, it's impossible for anybody to set a date line. Dr. Saab, thank you. Thank you. For My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you Thanks for having me. Thanks.